So this will be the last session of this morning, and we'll return in 2 o'clock. But the last presenter, I'm sure, needs no interaction. May I introduce Dr. Hiro Hirai? He is currently working at uh, uh, Bradbone University in the Netherlands. And he is the vice editor of Early Science and Medicine. And he has published widely in the Renaissance and Early Modern, as, as all of you know. And he was awarded the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Prize in February this year, 2015. So please welcome Dr. Hiro Hirai. So in so sorry to present in such a situation, but please apologize. Can you hear me? Although gazing is dominated Western medicine during the last uh, Middle Ages, physicians' knowledge of Galen's writing was very limited. Instead, they relied on interpretations of Galenism developed by Arabic physicians such as Axena. In the Renaissance, the substantial body of Galen's writings was made available thanks to the undying Greek edition published in Venice in 1525. This edition was uh, followed by Latin translations of individual treatments. The newly recovered Galen owed much to the, uh, to the medical humanists who were active in the early decade of the 16th century. Their effort introduced on the formation of Peters and other philosophically interesting texts to the West. Although Galen's writings frequently addressed the notion of the soul, he refrained delivering a definitive answer about its true substance. This is the famous attitude called agnosticism by modern scholars. In some places, he seemed inclined toward a naturalistic or a physicalistic interpretation. This came, at, uh, came close to that of his contemporary, Ale Alexander of Aphrodisias. The soul is the mixture, plasis, or temperamentum, of the prim uh, primal qualities, hot, cold, dry, and wet of the four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. If the soul results from the mixture of these qualities, it must be transient, just as other natural bodies. This would lead to the conclusion that the soul can be destroyed at death. In other places, Galen seemed to adopt a position close to the Platonists, so there was already a tension inside his writings. In what follows, I would like to address some Renaissance interpretations advanced for Galen's notion of the soul in the debate between two medical humanists, Niccolò de Muceno of Ferrara and Jean Fechner of Paris. Leniceno advanced the naturalistic interpretation which became popular among physicians and natural philosophers and which was even akin to Pietro Componazzi's conception of the soul. Farnes' reaction against Leniceno was related to the doctrine of immort immortality of the soul, one of the most important issues in philosophy after the Fifth Council of the Latland. Uh, 1512 to 1517. By studying this debate, I would like to consider the role of humanism in the history of philosophy, medicine, and science. Belonging to the generation of medical humanists active in Italy at the turn of the 16th century, Niccolò Leonicello was prolific in producing widely used translations of Galen's works. Inspired by the Greek physicians' newly recovered treatise on the formation of the fetus, Leonicello composed one of the first humanist embry embry sorry, embryological works on formative power, the, uh, the virtute formativa, Venice, 
1506. This treatise was written upon the request of a friend to explain the views of Aristotle and Galen on the nature of formative power, which was traditionally ascribed to the sea by traditions. The original first was the words of Galen. There, Galen uh, confessed to be ignorant as to the agent that forms the fetus, acknowledging the presence of a superior intelligence in fetal formation. He asked if it is the soul residing in the seed. According to Galen, the Aristotelians called this soul vegetative, and the Platonists appetitive, while the Stoics did not call it soul but nature. Galen himself believed that the soul in the seed should be unintelligent, uh, a loss. Although his former Platonist master had taught him to ascribe the cause of fetal formation to the world soul, Galen felt it blasphemous to imagine that the dreadful beast like scorpions are formed by the divine soul of the universe. All he could accept for certain was the presence of supreme intelligence. The quoted passage suggests that Galen did not have a definitive answer. The Nietzsche affirms, however, that Galen opted for the vegetative soul. Indeed, Galen presented this idea as Hippocrates in his treatise on semen. Comparing animals and plants, he argued that the fetus must have first, uh, sorry, must first possess a vegetative principle which fashions its bodily parts from the seed. The Nietzsche, in his turn, deduces that Galen followed Hippocrates faithfully by conceiving the cause of fetal formation as a faculty of the vegetative soul in the seed. Besides this solution, Galen argued in his commentary on Hippocrates, aphorisms that the animal's natural heat forms, nourishes, and augments its body. There are thus two divergent ideas. Despite this, the general defense Galen's coherence. I quote, nobody should think that Galen disagrees with himself or with Hippocrates because of the following fact. He attributes the formation of an animal on the one hand to the vegetative soul in the sea, as it said in the book on semen, and on the other hand to natural heat, as is described in the first part of aphorisms. For the idea that the soul is nothing but the body's natural heat or constitution called the temperament is also a teaching of Hippocrates." End quote. According to the Nietzscheno, Galen identified the cause of fetal formation with the temperament, that is the mixture of the four elemental qualities. To justify this interpretation, he calls upon Galen's treatise on Ptolemy. In a key passage for understanding his physiology, Galen called the animal's natural heat the soul. For him, this heat is neither of external origin nor coming after the animal's birth, but congenital to it. This is the Galenic doctrine of the innate heat, Arol Inatus. Thus, the Nietzscheno concludes that Galen agreed with Hippocrates. The heat given to the seed at birth is the soul which later vegetates the animal. For him, Galen's formative power should be considered a faculty of the vegetative soul, which is in turn identified with the innate heat or certain temperament or the bodies of living beings. French physician Jean Ferner was one of the most influential medical humanists of the Renaissance. His teachings exerted a considerable impact on his contemporaries and later generations, at least until the mid 17th century. Further rejected the religion's naturalistic interpretation of Galen because the soul of living beings, identified as natural heat or temperament, depends on the four elements is transient and is therefore destroyed with the body. To his eyes, 
this interpretation contradicted the Christian doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Falling upon Renaissance Platonism developed by the Florentine philosopher Marcelino Piccino, Fender tried to present another image of Galen, which could be harmonized with Christianity. The chief fruit of his endeavor was the dialogue on the hidden causes of things, the Tabulidis Brethren Causes, published in Paris, 1548. In this work, he advocated the quest for the divine, for Theon, in nature and in medicine. By the term divine, he signified something super-elemental and celestial, that is something lying beyond the sphere of the four elements and their forces. In the first part of his dialogue, Further offered a particularly platonizing readings of Aristotle on the basis of Renaissance belief in the ancient theology, Prisca Theologia. This belief, which favored the harmonization of the divergent ideas of the ancient, was reactivated by Piccino. Crucial to Ferner's manipulation was the pseudo Aristotelian treatise on the universe, the Mundo, adapting. Piccino's theory of the world of spirit further managed to establish a remarkable concordance not only between Plato and Aristotle, but also between the Greeks and the Christians. In the second part of the dialogue, Ferner tries to incorporate Galen into this theater of harmonization. Presenting a Christian Platonic interpretation of the Greek physician, he dares to build uh, so he dare, uh, dares to build his own Galenism through all the questions regarding the soul and God. Faithfully but selectively using Galen's, uh, Galen's words, mainly taken from the, on the doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato, further deconstructs and presents Galen's views that the soul is simple uniform and superior to the most subtle body, the spirit, Unuma. Then he tries to show the soul's celestial origin by arguing that Hippocrates proposed a divine opinion in the treatise on fleshes, the Carnivus. Uh, uh, this is words of uh, Hippocrates. I should say nothing about the heavenly and sublime things unless to the extent that human beings and the other animals that live and are begotten on earth have their principle and origin there, and that, uh, and that the soul comes from heaven." End quote. Fenner relies on a Renaissance translation that differs from the modern reading at a crucial point, the explicit assertion that the soul comes from heaven. Moreover, According to him, the soul must be immortal since Hippocrates continued in the uh, uh, next passage. In my view, what we call heat is immortal, which uh, perceives all and sees, hears, and knows all that is and all that will be. Using these lesser known passages with a cosmological dimension, further it insists that. Uh, Hippocrates advocated the uh, celestial origin and the immortality of the soul. To reinforce this argument, he calls upon the passage from the work attributed to Galen, which seems particularly platonizing. This is in reality drawn from the pseudo Galenic work on uterine conception, composed under a strong Platonic influence in the second century of our era. Without doubting its authenticity, Ferner says, I quote, Please listen to what Galen states divinely in the book on the uterine conception. A soul is a downflow of the universal soul, descending from the heavenly vision and capable of knowledge. Abandoning earthly things, it always aims at the highest points of all having a share of heavenly divinity. This clearly shows that Galen's opinion does not differ from that of Plato and Aristotle at all. 
they have spoken with one voice in confirming that our soul is simple, incorporeal, and immortal. End quote. The point of conjunction is the Platonic doctrine of the world soul, which is the quintessential core of Feldman's medical philosophy. For him, something celestial stands beyond the realm of the elements and cannot be destroyed. This immediately begs the question, how can the immortal soul reside in a perishable body? Uh, sorry, uh, reside in a perishable body. For Fanon, the soul does not perish despite its attachment to the body by a certain union called the chain of bonds. It is not the soul itself, but only this chain that can be damaged. Father identifies these bonds with the spirit and its innate heat. Then an extremely defect of the body causes them to perish, the soul being set free, abundance the body. Once the celestial origin and the immortality of the soul is confirmed, Father's next step is to show the divine nature of spirits in living beings. To this end, he classifies spirits into three categories. One, the spirit of God. Two, the spirit of nature. And three, the spirits in living beings. After establishing, sorry, establishing the agreement of the ancients as to the superior kind of spirit, he turns to the inferior one and tries to show that the spirits and its heat in living beings are celestial. Can anything celestial exist in their bodies? Father answers that many people made, uh, made an error precisely here by assuming that anything celestial is external to the body. Living beings at death must lose the cause of their life functions. It is not the soul, but, but only the heat of the spirit that is extinguished. This heat must bear a super-elemental and therefore celestial and divine nature as the order of life itself in living beings. After all discussions, Father explains what he understands by the term divine. Following Aristotle's words in the generation of well, in his generation of animals, book two, chapter three, he defines it and anything that corresponds by analogy to the element of the stars. This special element must be the fifth element, the incorruptible and eternal ether. For further, anything divine, including the soul and the spirit must emanate from the celestial realm. The religion was in the, uh, um, instrumental in the humanist revival of Galen's works. In, in his embryological discussion, he developed a naturalistic interpretation of Galen's notion of the soul based on the treatises such as on semen, on tremor, and the commentary on Hippocrates aphorisms. Fenner reacted against the Leonitian's interpretation and tried to harmonize Galen's idea with Christianity. He tried to defend, in particular, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, even in Galen's medical philosophy. His choice reflected the historical context where the issue of the immortality of the soul was crucial in the philosophical scene. He called upon Fichinian Platonism and relied on the Christian theology of belief, which paradoxically promulgated quite heterodox ideas from, the, from a religious point of view for later generations. What is important in the case of both figures was the adaptation of humanist style, in, uh, style argumentation. Here, typical humanist method of natural and medical philosophy can be observed. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Sugura, for the wonderful presentation. And now, we have come from angels to the astrology to the soul. Now, it's your turn to ask questions. 
he explains Gaelic's idea, and he explains Aristotle's idea, and so on. But he, ha he has his own uh, preference, and he, 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 his uh, preference uh, was given to uh, synthesis uh, position, which synthesis tries to uh, harmonize um, Plato and Aristotle in a neoplatonic way, and um, this is a, as a conclusion he, he put in, in the uh, end of his treatise, but when he explains Galen's idea, he does not connect to his own idea, his own interpretation, and his, his understanding of Galen's idea. So, uh, Leonitian knew, for example, Bessarion's uh, treatise, and also Hitchino's uh, doctrines, teachings, but he does not uh, mix, connect, try to connect, or to make some kind of um, uh, mixture with Galen's idea. Uh, he tries to understand Galen as Galen. That is why um, uh, he, I don't know in his selection, but uh, upon the selection of his uh, the Galen's text, his choice of Galen's text, uh, his conclusion was that Galen's uh, conception of the soul is very naturalistic. Very much. Any other questions? Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. And I'm, I'm not quite, quite sure the position of the, the harmonization uh, between Plato and Aristotle in, in, in that time. Uh, because I, 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 I miss one uh, element that, that is a pneumatic uh, understanding of Aristotle's vital uh, and in, in the formation of the uh, fearless. Of the newborn baby, and, and because the Aristotle uh, 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 recently uh, some Aristotelian, Aristotelian scholars stress on that uh, pneumatic element, uh, but, but I, I I don't agree with him. But but uh, anyway, the the, the later ex uh, interpretation of Aristotle uh, very. Uh, makes emph emphasis on that pneumatic element in Aristotle's theory. But I'm not quite sure that, that, that uh, the relation between the, the, uh, uh, our living body's pneumatic activities uh, uh, to the celestial uh, quintessential uh, uh, activities. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, there must be uh, some bridging theory between the, our uh, vital activity and the celestial activity. But do, uh, do you have some uh, uh, source uh, 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 texture of, uh, backup of that uh, linkage or the bridge? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, uh, uh, I Concerning Renaissance medical uh, authors like Dabnet uh, and his followers, the most important passage is Aristotle's Generation of Animals, book two, uh, uh, chapter three, where uh, Aristotle explains that in the semen uh, there is a pluma, and the pluma has a uh, heat for nature, which corresponds by analogy the element of stars. That's what Aristotle says, and uh, O'Fallon and his followers. This is the uh, linkage which explains um, uh, between celestial uh, realm and uh, earthly uh, the world of living beings. And this linkage is uh, so on um, this link, uh, this uh, to uh, realm of people. Uh, which work that uh, uh, celestial uh, nature 